I'm Larry Forsley. I've been uh, working in just about every field of fusion there is. I spent 13 years in uh, laser fusion. I spent five years in magnetic fusion with tokamaks and mirrors. And I've spent almost 18 years in cold fusion or confusion. <laughs> and uh, this is a result of analyses that we've been doing over the last year and a half, working specifically with the Spayor group and with uh, Privet's Gallium project. Uh, this is the Spayor Code Deposition cell that Pam spoke about this morning. Uh, we've got, in some of these, we've got our anode up here, the cathode below. Some of these were magnetic experiments, so they will rotate at 90 degrees. The instrumentation, again, CR39 that you've heard about, unlike what was done with the other groups, we scanned this with a tassel scanner, it's a computer scanner takes each of the 10 millimeter by 20 millimeter, uh, essentially one by two centimeter chips. And if you take both sides, we end up with 1,000 frames of 500 by 600 microns. I also make use of high, um, high purity germanium, cryogenically cooled, gamma ray detector, and a range of about 50 keV to two and a half MeV with a two kilovolt resolution at 1.3 MeV. And this was time resolved. I would take these in a series of 13 second windows. We've also done this uh, with sodium iodide with one second windows. But the problem we have there is that the resolution is much worse. It's closer to five kilovolts. It's much more difficult to essentially figure out what you've got for spectrum. Now, again, with charged particles, there is a range that they will go. And this is the thickness of the CR39. Uh, this is 100 microns, this is 1,000 microns. This is the energy of the particle to go through. And what I want you to remember are these three things right here. One millimeter of CR39 will stop a 10 million electron volt proton, a 14 million electron volt deuteron, or a 40 million electron volt alpha particle. That's what it takes to get all the way through the CR39. If you see something on the back, and it's a charged particle, and it came from the front, this is what it's got to be doing. This is an example of a calibration we use. This is from uranium U238. These are alpha tracks. And you can see their little shapes. This is covering one of our fields of view, 600 microns. We then etched it for six hours in six and a half molar sodium hydroxide at 70 degrees C. This is more or less a standard procedure to do this. Now, questions have been raised. Well, you know, interaction with you know, electrolyte, things like this, because CR39 is actually intended to be used either in vacuum or in air. So we've run the experiments behind a six micron mylar window. Same three-wire E-field experiment, no contact between the CR39 and the electrolyte, and passing through six mylar, six microns of mylar, a proton will lose about a half an MeV, and an alpha will lose about one and a half MeV. And I, again, the curve here, so just pulling it off the curve, that's what we'd stop. Now, it's hard to see because the tracks are reduced. The number of tracks we see are reduced, which tells us something about the energies of the purported particles. I used the computer system to go through and identify all the candidates. You can see there's actually quite a few in this field of view. I then have it go through and identify them. The ones that are green are identified, the ones that are red are not. One of the things we learned with the scanner is it will tend to underrepresent by as much as a factor of 10 what I would consider optically, looking at it with my eye, what is a real track. Now, why does this happen? A lot of it has to do with the shape of the track because the density of our tracks are so high, they tend to be on top of each other. So these things confuse the issue for identification. So as I show you numbers as we go along here, which are tracks that we see with the counter, in fact, we've got a lot more tracks than that because we can't differentiate. Now, if I take a piece of CR39 on the front and on the back, and I scan a slice, a thousand microns, one millimeter wide, and it's 17 millimeters long. This is not the scale, it's been squashed down. This is the front side. This experiment had three wires, a platinum wire, a silver wire, and a gold wire. On the back side, you'll see that this structure appears right on the back side. That's a millimeter of this. And I see the gold coming across. In fact, I can even see some of this structure in here appearing on the back side. Interestingly, the silver does not leave an impression. Now, if one wants to argue that what's going on in the back side is a function of chemistry, explain where the silver wire went. <laughs> okay? 
So the key point here is this. You've got platinum, silver, and gold tracks in the front, platinum and silver on the back, uh, gold on the back, no tracks from silver on the back. And again, the number of tracks exceeds our ability to count and correlate. We've observed over 10,000 tracks per square millimeter at times. We've done this by taking the field of view of one of these and three people independently going through and counting these. So you take, if you put this across the entire track, it's absolutely astonishing. When I first became involved with using CR39 with the Spayware group, I took some of this up to one of my old labs that I worked at in the hot fusion industry. And when they looked at this, the first comment they said was, what kind of particle accelerator did you do this with? We've never seen tracks with this density before. And I said, well, it's, it's a Navy project, and just left it at that. <laughs> Now, the problem I've got is on the other side is what's on the back side, all right? If I went through a millimeter of CR39 and I'm a charged particle, I've either got to be a 10 MeV proton, a 14 MeV deuteron, or a 40 MeV alpha particle. Well, let's look at the front and the back. First of all, here's uranium U238. I have this structure. I've got some very small, and I've got this typical structure. This is distant. This is the diameter in microns. And this is the number of counts. And this is the kind of structure you would get from an alpha particle. It turns out U238 is a 4.2 to 6.9 MeV alpha. All right, now I took the front side and I had to rescale this so you could actually see these structures because it was predominantly these smaller holes. And generally what this means is it's a faster particle. So these may very well be protons here. So I've got a structure here, and it's also roughly 8 to 12 microns, which would say that I'm seeing on the front a 4.2 to 6.2 MeV alpha. Now on the back side, I've got the same structures, but look at what's happened here. This is much larger, and this one, which let's say starts around 12 and goes out, in fact it goes well past 30 microns. There are tracks out 40 and 50, even to 60 microns. It's like somebody drove a truck through the back side. So something is causing these large tracks on the back side. And the problem is we don't really have consistent data with the front side because these had to go from the front to the back. So we don't have those here. So with neutrons, it turns out CR39 will pick off neutrons with a terrible efficiency. About one in a hundred thousand will smack into an atom, one of the hydrogen, carbon, or oxygen that's sitting in there. And these will then cause a knock-on, which we'll see out the back. But because the efficiency is so low, the low neutron stopping power, if you keep etching away at the plastic, you will get more or less the same count because there have been knock-ons all through it, and they just haven't made it the rest of the way. So this is the back side with a little deeper focus that look like proper tracks. These are neutrons from plutonium oxide. And you can see double tracks. Uh, this one, I don't have triple tracks, primarily because this does not have the 12 MeV required to crack a carbon nucleus into three parts. We have seen three tracks together. And the last piece here is we've taken some gamma data. This is preliminary gamma data taken with a palladium deuteride codep cell nickel screen taken over 10 hours. We had unexpected gamma lines that were not present in the background spectrum. They occur in multiple 13 second time windows. And this is the possible identification. Strontium 92, zirconium 97. This has a half-life of 2.7 hours, and it has as its primary line, 90% of the uh, gamma will come out as a 1.4 MeV gamma. Same thing with the strontium. The point that's interesting here is, this is only for one window. The six times shorter half-life isotope is 11 times brighter. This looks like we've got real evidence for gamma rays coming out of one of these cells now for the first time. So in conclusion, the spayware co-deposition cell consistently repeatedly produces tracks. The tracks are consistent with both nuclear charged particles and neutron knock-on tracks. The tracks are not of chemical origin, although chemical damage may occur. Gamma data in offers insight into the nuclear mechanisms causing the tracks, unless you can come up with some other mechanism. More real-time, spectrally resolved, charged particle 
Neutron and gamma ray diagnostics are needed. And it's my belief that the robust SPAWA protocol may allow a theory determination. Thank you. Public Benefit Corporation, which provides information and educational services to help bring about a clean energy revolution. 